Good job, guys. Um, whose question? Oh, I don't think we need to go through this. That should be good then. So this was my question from last week. Um, so all the other ones except for mutation. So mutation um, is the source of new alleles. So it doesn't alter what's already there, but it's something new that's coming into the population. Um, whereas migration, genetic drift, and non-random mating, um, it's just shuffling inside that population. So it's altering what's already existing there. Okay. Shannon in the lead. Phenotype. Oh, I didn't go through that one. Um, but I think there was characteristic of an organism and appearance of an organism. So characteristic was basically the definition for trait. Whereas when you think of phenotype, phenotype is the appearance. That's the main difference between the two. All right. Someone want to go through this? Um, yep. Yeah, so this is pretty good. So fatty acid synthesis would occur um, when there's high level of carbohydrate in the system um, because that means there's already energy being produced. So fatty acid synthesis can occur for um, storage. And also when there's like a low level of fat as well, you want to be producing more fat. Yep. Thank you. Cloud in the wind. quite good with this. All right, um, so this one is, so all of, all of the, um, the pillars are important, but the question was asking which one's the most important. So if we were to go through like all the definitions, autonomy refers to the patient's right to make their own decision. 
which is important in every situation. Beneficence is um, referring to the doctor's responsibility to do what's good for the patient. Non-maleficence refers to the doctor's responsibility to ensure that um, whatever procedure or treatment or whatever is undergone doesn't cause more harm to the patient. And then justice is referring more to the equal distribution of healthcare. So the two that um, are often sort of confused are beneficence and non-maleficence. So in this situation, the patient's quite old, um, the patient, so I think the patient is like an endel, elderly gentleman. His options are either to continue living uh, his life, but <coughs> he will need a full-time carer. He won't be able to like carry out his life as he would want to. And a key term there is lowering his quality of life. The, op the other option being like, he might not, might not necessarily live for as long, but he's living it in a comfortable way. And sort of in this situation, it's important that given the fact that he's an elderly gentleman without necessarily a cure as such for whatever his issue is, it's probably more important for the treating team to be looking out for him and ensuring that the life that he does continue to live for however long that is, is not one that's full of pain and suffering, which is the concept of non-maleficence. Alrighty, thank you. Last question. Yeah. So, yeah. I'll do a quick explanation. I think the question could have been worded a tiny bit better in terms of the categories of key determinants impacting one's health. Um, and technological was a kind of fake answer that I just threw in um, just to kind of confuse people. Um, so uh, it's actually biological, environmental, social, and behavioral um, are the sort of categories that we use. Um, and technological was, um, yeah, obviously one that isn't correct. Um, but yeah. All right, thanks everyone. Um, yeah. So we have Chen coming third, yay. Madcam coming second, and Captain Jones, yay. All righty. Okay, can we all see this? Yep, all good. Starting off with epithelium, I believe that's a kangsha. Uh, yep, this one's me. So could you please go to the next slide? Yeah. Thanks. So there's a few features that are general to all types of epithelium, which is that which is that it's the tissue that forms the internal and external surfaces of the body. So for example, the GIT, the skin and the urinary tract. Uh, and these cells are tightly packed together with strong attachments between them. And they're all orientated in the same direction, which means that they're polarized. Um, so all of them will have the same side of the cell attached to the uh, basement membrane and facing the lumen. Uh, they're also avascular, meaning they have no blood supply and they have a strong regenerative capacity. Uh, so there's five main functions of epithelium that I think came up quite a lot on Moodle quizzes. Um, and they're just protection, absorption, secretion, transport and sensory perception. Uh, so I've got a few images of the different types of epithelium here. So the way that we can classify epithelium is through both the number of layers of cells, as well as the shape of those cells. Uh, 
So if there's a single layer of cells, that's called simple epithelium, whereas multiple layers of cells is called stratified epithelium. And there's three main shapes that you need to know about. The first is squamous epithelium. So if you look in the image, um, it's the picture on the top left. So it's basically just um, thin, flattened cells, and you would find these, for example, in your skin. Um, then there's also cuboidal epithelium, which, like what it sounds like, they're just cube-shaped. Um, and the last type is columnar. So with columnar, there's three different types, actually. So there's simple, stratified, and there's also a type of columnar epithelium called pseudostratified columnar um, epithelium. And you can find this in your um, GI tract. And it looks like stratified columnar epithelium, but actually, if you look carefully at the picture, each of those cells is actually attaching to the basement membrane. So although it looks like they're in multiple layers, they're just um, in a single layer with nuclei at different levels. So, um, now we'll take a closer look at each surface of an epithelial cell. So the apical surface or the top surface is the one that faces the lumen or the empty space, whether that be in a vessel or in an organ or just on the outside of your skin. And this is the surface where you would find microvilli and uh, cilia. The lateral surface is where you have the junctions or the attachments between cells. And we'll go through a few of those attachments in a later slide because um, there's a few different types. And the basal surface is where they are attached to something called the basal membrane um, or the basal lamina. And they're attached to the basement membrane by junctions called hemidesmosomes. And the basal uh, membrane is produced by the epithelium itself um, since it's made by the type 4 collagen they secrete as well as proteoglycans and glycoproteins. Um, and the basin membrane is what provides the blood supply to the epithelium. So the vessels aren't within the epithelial cells themselves but rather they lie in the basement membrane. Um, so, yep, I've just got a few of the functions of the basement membrane there. So cell adhesion, maintaining the orientation and a source of blood supply and nutrients. Uh, and something that's quite important to know is that normally epithelial cells cannot cross the basement membrane. Um, and one of the signs of cancer is that those epithelial cells have crossed the basal lamina, which is what allows them to enter the blood vessels and metastasize. Uh, yeah, so now here's the different types of junctions that you can have between epithelial cells. So the first type, which is the top one on the diagram as well, is the zonular occludens or type junctions. And those form a seal to prevent substances from moving between cells. So with a lot of these, their name really gives away what the junction does. So with this one, the name is occludens. So it's going to occlude the space between cells um, and obstruct substances from passing between. The second type is zonular adherence, um, also second on the diagram. Um, and similarly, you can tell from the name what it does. So it adheres the cells together or sticks them together. Um, and these ones are found on the lateral surface of the cell as well. Um, and they are attachment points for the cytoskeleton. Next, we have macular adherence, also known as desmosomes. So these ones also um, adhere cells together, but the difference between the zonular adherence and the macular adherence is that the zonular adherence would wrap around the entire side of the cell, whereas the macular adherence is only found in specific spots. Um, and lastly, there's gap junctions, which just allow the movement of substances between cells. Okay, so intro to integrative medicine. 
Um, next slide, please. So first off, what is integrative medicine? So it's basically a combination of conventional medical treatments um, and then complementary therapies. And the key is um, evidence-based complementary therapies um, and um, also lifestyle in interventions. Um, and it's important because we wanna obviously give our patients the best level of care. Um, and in terms of exams with integrative medicine, um, I think some of the questions might involve statistics, which isn't exactly nice. Um, and maybe even just having a general idea of like what integrative medicine is, what um, complementary medicine is and alternative medicine is, is um, a good idea. Um, so a lot of what I'm gonna go cover might not be exactly high yield. Um, just letting all of you know that. Okay, next slide, please. So orthodox medicine is what we're taught in med school, what you're learning right now. Um, but it's important to know that even though this is what we're learning, it might not always be backed by evidence. Whereas unorthodox medicine is not widely practiced in widely recognized, sorry, in clinical practice. But this doesn't mean that it doesn't have any evidence. Um, yep. Yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so complementary medicine, um, it's basically um, treatment that we would use alongside with um, co conventional medicine. So keyword is alongside, not instead of or um, anything like that. Um, and there can be a number of reasons why we do that, for example, um, to reduce costs. Um, but obviously more studies need to be done into complementary medicines, but it should be generally safe for patients. Um, next slide, please. And alternative medicine, on the other hand, is when um, it's used instead of um, conventional medication. Um, and this is a bit more um, problematic if it involves the rejection of um, appropriate medical care. Um, but if there is um, good evidence and there's less side effects and um, things like that, then it's okay. Um, and so obviously when you're talking to your patients, it's important to think of all the different treatment plans that are available. So that's why we're learning about this. Um, next slide, please. And so complementary and alternative medicine can, um, is just basically a combination of the two together. Um, and here are some statistics that might possibly come up in exams, might not, but just be aware of that. Next slide, please. Um, and so here are some reasons about why people, why patients might prefer CAM, um, such as misinformation. Um, well, I mean, if doctors should be worried about misinformation in regards to CAM um, and obviously false hope as well. But um, yeah, as doctors, you have to be receptive to their um, concerns and answer any questions that they may have. Next slide, please. Um, and so there are a few um, uh, modalities. So there's the biologically based practices, mind, body, energy, medicine, and manipulative and body based practices. And they can be linked to a cultural group. Um, but despite that, the people using the different modalities don't have to believe in the certain culture or be part of that certain culture. Next slide, please. So I've just separated some of the different alternatives, um, CAMs, into the different um, modalities. Um, you don't, I don't think you really need to memorize this at all, but just to have an idea. Um, and next slide, please. So this slide is just basically about what you can take into when you're practicing as a doctor. So it's always important to not be judgmental and respecting your patient's concerns and um, making time for you to be able to have those discussions with your patients. And I think that's it. Yeah, so I'm going to be going through some of the behavioral change and lifestyle and motivation. Um, this is sort of from your HEP lectures. Again, sort of similar to what Laksh does. It's not super high yield, but there are some specific things that they like you to know. Um, the first of which is essence. Um, so. Yeah, it's a great acronym made by Dr. Craig Hassett himself. Um, so as well as its sort of relevance to HEP, 
This is also something that people use when they're taking their social history, um, just to make sure that they're hitting all of the important points. Um, but yeah, it's really just a case of memorizing that acronym. Yeah, next slide. Okay, preventative medicine. Um, so there's basically three sort of tiers of prevention. There's primary prevention, which is the sort of medicine that we carry out or aim to carry out to prevent the disease from occurring in the first place. And this happens through modifying risk, risk factors and like changing people's lifestyles. Um, so that can be like to say, um, stopping smoking, um, reducing alcohol consumption, trying to lose weight, um, those sorts of things. Um, the second tier is secondary prevention. So this is the sort of um, steps we're taking to slow the progress of the disease um, when it's already like happening in the patient, but we're sort of slowing down the process. Um, and yeah, this is generally a combination of lifestyle modifications and treatment. For certain illnesses, um, even if they've already started to have the illness, if they have certain lifestyle modifications, like again, losing weight, stopping smoking, stopping excessive consumption of alcohol, it can have a really um, powerful effect on their um, prognosis. Um, tertiary prevention. So this is when the chronic disease has already been established and there, like, and there are significant complications that are occurring. And this, is, this sort of prevention is more focused on preventing further issues and further complications from happening. Um, if we move on to the next slide. So BASC is sort of um, a good acronym to try and remember when you're trying to encourage some sort of change. And it's, um, it sort of helps you understand how to approach change with your patient. So behaviors, so how will your patient, or how does your patient act? Um, attitudes, what does your patient believe? Skills, what what can your patient carry out at this moment in time? And knowledge, what does your patient know about this at the moment? What can you as their doctor tell them? Um, and yeah, addressing any one of those four can have a really big um, impact on having more prolonged um, effective change in your patient. Motivational interviewing. Um, this is again, something that comes up in clinical skills as well. Um, and it's, the type of conversation you have with a patient when you're trying to assess and understand if the patient is willing to change and um, you're trying to encourage them to do so. Um, but the way in which you have to do it is to not try and force it upon the patient, but sort of make the patient look introspectively and come to understand that they are wanting to change. Um, and so, yeah, ADEPT is a good acronym for that. There's the awareness, um, in the patient, the decision to make that change, the effort that they're going to put towards it, the perseverance to continue that effort, and then tolerance for some like the discomfort of, of quitting smoking and any of the difficulties that they'll face, but the willingness to keep pushing through that is, um, is basically what ADEPT is um, standing for. And it's something that you should try and assess in your patient as you're trying to do the motivational interview. Um, move on to the yeah. So I think a lot of people have heard of smart goals before. Um, so when trying to encourage a patient to have make some sort of change in their lifestyle, it's important that the ways that the goals that they're setting are actually achievable. Um, and so this framework of smart, so specific, measurable, attractive realistic and timely, um, they're good sort of headings to try and encourage the, your patient to create goals that they can actually achieve. So whether that's sort of saying once a day, I'm going to run for 20 minutes um, and I'm going to do it for this amount of time. So that's specific and measurable and you're giving them a, an amount of time to do it. And it's not unrealistic like they're not saying I'm going to run a marathon next week they're just saying I'm going to try and run or walk for 20 minutes every day for six months um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well um, and the there are some questions in the exams that will come up with um, there are some questions surrounding smart goals that come up in exams 
um, if we move on to the next slide. So the Prochesca di Clementi cycle, this is something that comes up again and again. Um, and it's, uh, it sort of, again, refers to the fact that we as medical professionals should not be pushing our patients to change. It should be something that they come to on their own. And it's sort of our responsibility, responsibility to understand where they are in that sort of cycle of, um, of moving towards change. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, this is, this is this, um, the cycle that I'm pretty sure comes up in your lectures as well. But it's basically that um, the beginning of the cycle is a pre-contemplation stage. So it's when a patient is beginning to sort of have ideas of um, maybe stopping smoking for example, and then contemplation would be when they're um, making some sort of step towards getting more information. So whether that's coming to their doctor, doing a bit of research, that sort of thing. Preparation would then be to speak to their doctor about it, to create an action plan, um, have a discussion about what, um, what medications or how they're gonna stop um, smoking and what's the best way for them to carry out that action. Action, pretty straightforward. They're gonna try and stop smoking. Now, the aim is to try and um, after action to keep the patient in maintenance. So they're going to keep um, continuing to not, not smoke. But obviously, sometimes the patient will can go into relapse. Um, and so the cycle sort of starts again. Um, and they have to sort of enter that stage of thinking about quitting again and then moving on from there. Um, but yeah, this is something that will come up a few times. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's a few questions in the exams that will ask which stage of the, of the cycle is the patient in. Yeah, all right, moving on to in introduction to health and human behavior um, as a part of the medicine of the mind uh, curriculum. So again, um, these stuff, I guess this lecture in particular, there's not that much high yield things. So we're just trying to use our slides to condense everything and just putting all the high yield information. So uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the biopsychosocial model. If you haven't heard of this model before, um, well, you're going to hear about it for many times throughout your medical school journey. Um, so that's because it is really a good framework to look at for us to look at, say, a medical condition or um, someone's health condition, because it's not just like the biology. It's not just like what caused uh, the disease Um not just the biological factors, but also like the person's psychological and social factors. So what the bio biopsychosocial model is, is a model that examines the interconnection between biology, psychology, and social environmental factors in health and disease. So some examples of um, like the biological factors could be um, like their genetic predisposition and like their general health, like whether they're immunocompromised, things like that. Um, psychological factors could be like their attitude and belief towards um, health and um, disease, um, like their self-esteem or like whether they are happy, if they're depressed, things like that. Uh, social factors could be um, their culture, their family, um, their socioeconomic status. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So you'll see this diagram a lot of times in the future as well. So this is just like a visual re representation of the biopsychosocial model. So you can see like it's like a Venn diagram. So like the inter intersection of that is kind of how we should look at health. And just to apply this um, with an example, for example, let's say someone has um, what example should we use? Let's say someone has um, addiction, like drug ad uh, dependency, that sort of thing. So like biological factors could be, so like there could be some, uh, say, genetic um, predisposition that caused them to kind of have a certain, like a high response to a drug, um, something like that. And like for the psychology, it could be uh, maybe they are um, this person has a higher level of stress or um, this person is um, less likely to like have a mindset that caused them to less likely to acknowledge the drug problem. Um, and for social interaction it could be they grew up in a say the environment where they have um, they have a lot of access to like drugs or they have um, lower socioeconomic status. Um, yeah, it's just something like that. So like when you look at it, um, like a condition or someone's health, it's like there are a lot of factors that's um, impacting this person, not just um, their biological factors. 
Okay, moving on. So this is another model. So it's called the four piece model. So that's predis predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating, and protective. So predis predisposing factors are those factors that um, put the person at risk of developing a problem. Um, pre precipitating factors are specific events um, that triggered the, um, like the directly lead, lead to the problem. Uh, perpetuating factors are those um, that kind of cause the problem to like stay there. So like it's like maintain the problem rather than kind of the person gets better uh, very quickly. And protective factors kind of like the only positive things in here is like the fact that the things that um, protect the person from um, developing that problem or from like getting worse. All right, um, next slide is just, um, which is a table that shows you some examples of these four P's and also put it into uh, kind of um, connected with the biopsychosocial approach as well. So you could have a look at this in your own time. Oh uh, yeah, and this slide. So um, actually we covered something similar to this in HKS um, in first week as well. So here just reiterate that um, understanding of health is different for different people, for people from different culture and like people living in different time, different era as well. So it is not really not like a singular definition. And even the WHO's definition has its flaw as well. But pretty much we kept the slide because of the meme at the corner there. All right, that's all. Okay, so biotechnology. So yeah, I decided to start off with this meme today because um, recombination is gonna be kind of a key term throughout this whole topic. So keep that in mind, keep calm and keep recombining. All right, next slide, please. Um, so the way I decided to approach biotechnology is a little bit different from how I approach H how I approached HKS in weeks one and two. So since it's a bit more heavy, I decided to split it up into its various learning objectives, which you can usually find at the beginning of your lecture slides. And I've color coded them because we all like colors. And uh, yeah, I'll just be color coding each subtopic as we go through the le learning objective. Oh, um, ooh, Puiti Kawas. Why, thank you, random ooh emoji thing. Um, Appreciate it. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so to start off with, um, yeah, so recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. So that's a quite a mouthful, but basically, let's break it down to its key parts. Tissue plasminogen activator is just a protein that can be readily found in your body, and it helps to break down blood clots. But in some patients, it's not exactly working properly, so we might have to make it artificially. And that's what recombinant means. We just cut bits of DNA from other things and we put it together with TP. Um, we put it together to make like actual TPA that can be used in patients. So what we start with is we start with complementary DNA, which, um, so we isolate the TPA gene from the genome, an existing genome that might not exist in the patient. And then we add this thing called BAMHI. It's a fancy name for just, it's like an expression vector with selection markers for E. coli. And um, E. coli is kind of uh, the way that we carry these selection markers. That's kind of the relevance of it here. And once we combine BAMHI with, TP, with the TPA gene from our complementary DNA, then we, um, then we get our cloned TPA gene. And once we transform it, we can get um, DNA with TPA and the E. coli. So that's basically how we produce TPA artificially. So this means that the foreign gene is expressed in E. coli. So that's our host cell for this gene. And that's because we have the expression vector present, BAMHI. And then we can use it in patients to help with blood clotting, heart attacks or strokes. So that's the whole crux of it. Next slide, please. So let's break it down or chop it up as we've seen recombination. So key components of the process are the expression vector, which in this case is BAMHI. Um, we have ligation, which is when we rejoin two DNA molecules, which, um, which is a part of the process that I didn't mention in the previous slide. We also have the selection of antibiotic, which is relevant in this case. And um, 
we of course we have our gene of interest which is like the tpa gene and then we have the transformation which, which is ultimately into the dna and i should um i should I don't know that I will be adding more detail to these slides later, just for your reference when you want to revise, so you can appreciate it in its full glory later on. Now, I just decided to add this slide because I mentioned it in the lecture, but it doesn't have any real relevance to the learning objectives except for the last red highlighted dot point. So the point of hormone replacement therapy is that it restores growth in children who have hypopituitary dwarfism or achondroplasia dwarfism. So just to be clear, hyperpituitary dwarfism is a type of um, growth disorder which is caused by um, a malfunctioning pituitary gland. And you might know that pituitary gland is important in making growth hormone. And achondroplasia dwarfism is, um, is an, of course, another type of dwarfism that is caused by, um, oh, it's caused by like malfunction, like it doesn't, cartilage that doesn't grow properly, especially in the arms and the legs. And of course, without growing legs, it's hard to grow tall. So you'd find that people with achondroplasia dwarfism have abnormally short arms and legs. Um, it is, just so you know, it is very costly and it's risky, but people still do it. Um, but something that has helped out with HRT is that the recombinant protein um, that is used in it is made um, is made in bacterial or mammalian cells, and it results in an um, unlimited commercial supply of the human growth hormone. So that is kind of the app direct application of recombinant DNA in HRT. All right, that was kind of the relevance of it. All right, the next learning objective is to explain the basic principles of polymerase chain reactions, or PCR. You might know PCR because it is generally like a gold standard kind of test like diagnostic tests for many diseases, including COVID-19, I believe. So, um, so yeah, so that is one application of PCR, which is in diagnostics. It's also used in forensics. And just so you know, like the way we can use PCR in diagnosis is that you can identify if there's a pathogen in your body by kind of, because if, if there is the pathogen present in the body, you can actually copy sections of its DNA and just amplify it. So that's kind of how we use it in diagnosis. But let's go through the actual process of how it works. So we start, of course, with our original DNA. Um, uh, yeah, original DNA, um, which is lined as such, 5 prime 3. Um, well, that's how it's supposed to be. And then we add the, um, we, we denature it. So that means we heat the DNA to separate into its single strands because it's naturally double stranded as you probably know. And the temperature for that is usually more than 90 degrees Celsius. After this, we anneal the DNA, meaning that we combine the primers at ideally less than 65 degrees Celsius. And, and we add a bunch of stuff like DNA polymerase, um, there's DATP, DGTP, and I'll be adding these things to the slides later on for more details. And finally, we have extension, which is when it's basically how we produce the DNA from the primers. And the ideal temperature for this is about 68 to 72 degrees Celsius. The temperatures vary between sources. So I don't believe you have to know the precise number, just kind of have a vague idea of what it is. So yeah, that's basically the three steps of PCR. And onto the next learning objective then, which is explaining how DNA technology can be used to produce large quantities of therapeutics. Um, so it's, I guess there's not a whole lot to this learning objective. It's more that you just have to know DNA technology can be used to produce large quantities of a functional form of protein that is deficient or defective in a patient, which we did basically cover um, just earlier with HGH and also TPA. So that's how we can fix diseases in patients. And after this, the protein is injected into the patient to alleviate symptoms, for example, in replacement therapy, like H hormone replacement therapy. All right, next slide, please. Um, next learning objective is to define the concept of therapeutic cloning. So therapeutic cloning is essentially, um, it's when you use existing cells to kind of clone 
it's to clone other cells for use in treating diseases as opposed to reproductive cloning. So for example, Dolly the sheep, that's not therapeutic clone, that is reproductive clone. So we're not going to discuss that here because one thing is it's very, its use is quite controversial. So we focus more on therapeutic cloning, which is more, um, more accepted, I suppose, is a better way to say it. So somatic cell nuclear transfer is when is, um, as you might guess, it's when you transfer the nucleus from a normal patient cell to an enucleated egg. So enucleated means the nucleus has been removed. And the result is that you get embryonic cell lines with the same genome as the nuclear donor. So it's reproducing. And this can generate differentiated patient-specific cell lines of specific tissue types, which we can call pluripotent stem cells. All right, next slide. So how does therapeutic cloning work? Um, so there's two methods that we can use. So one is when you make it, so one is when you use somatic cell nuclear transfer to make embryonic stem cells, which can then differentiate into more specialized ones, or we can actually use adult stems, adult cells to become pluripotent stem cells and make them differentiate. So we'll be covering both processes. Uh, just to define what pluripotent is, they're basically cells that can differentiate to other types of cells. Pluripotent cells form all somatic and sex cells of the embryo, but they can't form anything outside of the embryo. So that's specifically for the embryo. All right, that's that slide. Um, uh, I don't know what why that's not appearing, just press. Okay, so the first method, as I was explaining, is the um, somatic cell nuclear transfer for embryonic cells. So we start with our somatic body cell with the desired genes. So yeah, it's a bit like a designer of babies, except we're not gonna make babies, we're gonna use it for therapeutic cloning. And then we have the, nu the nucleus taken out of it and it's fused with a enucleated or denucleated egg cell. Um, so this is the egg cell here, so they kind of converge at this point. And then you can clone it to make um, a, a zygote and then we'll divide and develop into early embryo. And then you can culture, and this is not shown here, but you can culture it in nutrient medium. And then um, essentially what happens is the um, resulting thing is made to differentiate. So of course, we're not focusing on reproductive cloning here. This is for therapeutic cloning, and it will result in a tissue culture, which we can inject into a patient. Okay. And the second method, which I was discussing earlier, is re reprogramming adult cells. So we can take adult somatic cells and we can put, we can grow them in a lab culture and add a bunch of things, reprogramming factors to make it better. And um, eventually what happens is, so to be specific, you add vector carrying, sorry, add several vector carrying genes controlled by an active promoter. Then you select the cells carrying the vector and then you just grow them so they become, so you get a bunch of cells that have the characteristics you want. So you have induced pluripotent stem cells at the very end, which will differentiate. And I think that was it for this one. Okay, human, so the next, next learning objective is um, explain the basic principle of gene therapy. So gene therapy is not, not just, okay, there is more for this stop point actually. So gene therapy is, as I've been saying, oh, well, okay, I haven't really said it, but in, it's when you introduce and express normal alleles or a normal allele into a patient with two normal abnormal alleles for important genes. And this can relieve symptoms caused by genetic diseases. Now, can anyone give me an example of a disease that might, um, that might use gene therapy? And preferably something that you, I don't know if you've covered already, I think, but. Um, just give it a shot. What do you reckon? Um, okay, it's all right if you don't have any ideas, but I was thinking something like um, cystic fibrosis. Um, so that is something where you have two abnormal alleles. It's like a recessive, autosomal recessive disorder. So gene therapy would actually help for something like this. Yeah. All right. Next slide. So the process of gene therapy is you grab viral DNA. So viruses are notably good for changing DNA sequences, which is kind of their purpose in life. 
And if you combine it with a normal allele, you get your recombinant DNA. Then you insert it into a virus, which is going to carry this normal um, recombinant DNA. And then you insert the virus into a sick patient's somatic cell. And then you get a virus carrying normal allele. In, and it will fix you, fix the sick patient. Okay. Um, so the use of gene editing in gene therapy. So this learning objective is um, explain how gene editing can be used in gene therapy. So, well, that's exactly what this is. That was self-explanatory. So gene editing can be better than conventional gene adding because the corrected gene is inserted locally, allowing for internal transcriptional control. Now, does anyone know the reason why conventional gene adding might be problematic? compared to just editing a gene inside that already is inside you? Anyone? Um, okay, so the reason is, that's all right. The reason is, um, so if you add if you add a gene into your body, it is more likely that your body's immune response could reject it because, because it's a foreign body. Whereas if you edit something that's already inside you, it's more likely to accept it and it will be more effective. And on to the final learning objective that I'll be covering today, which is explaining how CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing works. And for this, I wanted to start off with a meme. So I don't know where you are, but I will find you and I will cut you. So the um, reason we're talking about this is because some gene cutting is going to be involved. And yeah, um, so I've got this diagram here, but I'll just be talking a lot of extra details, which I'll be adding onto the slide later. So um, normally start with bacteria. So, okay, this is extra stuff. Bacteria and archaea have many CRISPR sequences separated by unique spaces that are remnants of prior invaders. And when a virus with target, a target unique sequence invades a cell, RNA is made that includes CRISPR. So you add another RNA to which Cas9 nuclease, which is a nuclease, binds. The nuclease is a type of enzyme. Then this complex, this um, complex we see here in this third diagram binds to a unique target on invading viral genome, genome and the nucleus cuts viral DNA inactivating it. And then this prevents viral reproduction in the bacterial cell. And RNA can be made in a lab that has any desired target sequence and Cas9 binding, binding sequence so any gene can be inactivated. And then RNA is introduced into a cell with target DNA and when Cas9 cuts the target DNA, cell repairs it, the cell repairs it. So this can assist repair and introduce a specific mutation. And I will have more information about this on slides later. And that brings us to conclusion to biotechnology. And I hope I made that somewhat simpler for you. Awesome work, Savannah. Um, thanks heaps. Um, firstly, I'd just like to begin by giving a huge shout out to Chen. Uh, thanks for being here for the entire hour. Um, and we hope it's been pretty engaging. Um, so the sort of final, yeah, you guys got the love heart as well. Um, yeah, I'll chuck one in. Um, okay, so I guess I'll be ending uh, today um, by talking a bit about integrative tissue metabolism. Um, I'd probably say that this is one of the most high yield sort of topics that you'll um, be getting in, especially in your sort of SEM1 papers um, this semester. Uh, and on average, let's say for my end of year exam last year, uh, I had around five, five to six questions, which is a pretty large amount. Uh, now, what is sort of more generally before we begin, um, what is integrative tissue metabolism? So obviously in the past three weeks, you've covered metabolism, sort of talking about the different molecules and how they end up sort of producing energy for the body. Um, however, now we'll be actually talking about where do these molecules exist and which tissues in the body um, which like specific tissues in the body utilize which specific mo um, molecules um, to produce um, certain energy. And, and there's a bit of, um, yeah, there's sort of a few important sort of nuances that you should be aware of, um, especially with the heart, the RBCs and the brain. So we'll jump right in. So next slide. Yeah, thanks, Mahek. 
So yeah, the first uh, sort of tissue we'll be talking about is adipose tissue. Now, what is what is important here for you to understand? So adipose tissue is composed of adipocytes um, and it's primarily responsible for the storage of triacylglycerols. Um, now, what happens after a meal, right? Suppose we, um, we have a meal, uh, the fatty acids um, are then delivered by chylomicrons, which were, which was sort of covered in, in the previous week's um, PSPs. Um, so the fatty acids are delivered by chylomicrons and stored as triacylglycerols uh, in your adipose tissue. Now, what's important is in between meals, when we really, when our body needs that energy, what happens? Now, what happens is that our body has specific hormones which signal the need for energy, um, and that mobilizes triacylglycerols. Um, so when triacylglycerols are sort of metabolized and broken down, the gl glycerol that is left um, behind during this uh, mobilization then goes to the liver to undergo gluconeogenesis. Um, and in terms of the energy and the distribution, 95% comes from the beta oxidation of our fatty acids and only 5% from glucose um, to meet energy demands. Uh, yeah, so the next uh, sort of four slides, uh, I think, are probably the most high yield, and it sort of talks about skeletal muscles, um, and it's just very sort of closely aligned to the great me metabolic race, which is this sort of workshop that you encounter in year one. Uh, so now let's see, what are the important things here? Um, the important things to note are that your skeletal muscle cells are super specialized to produce ATP, um, and they can utilize pretty much any fuel source, um, and they have stores of both glycogen and fatty acids. Um, so what happens at rest? Uh, at rest, your um, skeletal muscle cells will be um, utilizing energy that comes from fatty acids um, through the beta oxidation, um, and the remainder comes from blood glucose, um, as well as a small portion from ketones. Um, and when you're moderately active, um, glucose is primarily used um, uh, from your glycogen stores, um, or energy is derived from your liver or the fatty acids and ketones as well. Um, all of this might be a lot of information, um, but there's a really good table at the end which so summarizes everything. Um, now, a really important thing is, so, so suppose you um, want a short burst of energy. Um, you're doing like a, a sprint of 100 meters. Um, and let's say in that first five second period, like let's ask the question, what, are, what, what sort of um, fuel is your, are your skeletal muscle cells using um, to, to get energy? And the answer to that is creatine phosphate. Um, as well as your ATP reserves. Um, that's a pretty um, common multiple choice question that you'll encounter in practice exams and, and possibly in your exam as well. Uh, and then when you're moderately active, I know I've gone through this, but normally it's the oxidation of glucose um, and then also um, the utilization of ketones um, as well as your glycogen stores and fatty acids. Uh, and now last two, um, when you're extremely active, um, what happens? Uh, the source that is used is stored glycogen, um, and that undergoes glycolysis um, and then becomes lactate, which enters the liver to be rejuvenated into glucose. Um, and alternatively, if you flip that with sort of when you're starving, um, muscle protein, sort of your muscles, you, as you, you might know, is made out of um, protein. Um, the muscle protein will be broken down into amino acids, um, which are then transported to the liver um, and then converted into glucose um, uh, to, to give us some energy. Um, and now here, this is sort of the, the main two diagrams that you'll encounter, um, which sort of summarize what I've been talking about. The diagram on the right, um, in particular, um, is, is being taken actually from the Great Metabolic Race. Um, and here you can see that at the beginning of, of a race, um, sort of in the first five minutes, uh, or sorry, in the first sort of two, two like in the very start, um, let's just go with that. Uh, your, bodily, your body is utilizing sort of your fatty acids, um, but then they slowly decrease and then your carbohydrate usage increases. Um, so that's just at the start. Um, and then as the race sort of goes on, um, the usage of fat sort of increases and carbohydrates diminishes. Um, and yeah, very important. Uh, so now these, there are some specific sort of tissues now that will, um, will want certain energy sources. And, and one of them are heart muscle cells. Um, so the heart cells are continuously active, as you can probably imagine, pumping blood all around our body, oxygenating um, the, the blood. Um, so a, a thing to note is that these cells cannot undergo anaerobic respiration, um, and also the heart has no energy stores. So then you ask the question, what does the heart primarily use? And the answer is fatty acids, um, and that's especially after eating. Um, and after a long time, the heart can also use glucose from the liver 
all ketones. Uh, so what I'd really take away from that slide is that the heart primarily uses fatty acids and if not glucose or ketones. Um, that's another sort of um, exam question that comes about. Uh, so again, the brain, as you can probably tell, is, is something that's constantly sort of active, something that's constantly regulating our body's processes. So it has a high rate of metabolism, um, but it doesn't have any fuel stores. Um, and for that reason, it must have a constant supply of energy. Um, what's important is the brain can only use glucose um, as its primary source and ketones during starvation, uh, because these are the only sort of molecules that can cross the blood brain barrier. Um, and like I said, under normal conditions, glucose is used um, and during starvation, the brain will use ketones. So again, um, this is uh, a pretty classic kind of exam question, multiple choice that you'll come across. What is the brain's main source of energy um, during uh, normal conditions or alternatively during starvation? Um, and the answers would be glucose and ketones respectively. Uh, and now another sort of specialized tissue slash cell um, that is uh, important to note. So the red blood cells or your RBCs, they don't have any organelles um, and they don't have uh, mito mitochondria either to undergo aerobic um, pathways. So what do the red blood cells use? They purely rely on glucose um, and they can only undergo anaerobic pathways. Um, so again, uh, key information, high yield information, um, purely rely on glucose and can only undergo anaerobic pathways. Uh, that's for sure something that we were assessed on last year. And like I promised, um, this is a table um, which is really useful at sort of summarizing everything that we've gone through in, in terms of integrated tissue metabolism. Uh, so you have, let's just begin with the first sort of row. Uh, you have your skeletal muscle cells. So like I said, at rest, the main sort of um, energy sources are fast fatty acids. Um, then for short bursts, it's your ATP reserves or your creatine phosphate. When you're moderately active, it's glucose. When you're extremely active, it's that stored glycogen. And if you're starving, it's that um, the protein of your muscles um, that is used um, and they're broken down into amino acids. Um, now, if you compare that with the next three sort of specific tissues, you have red blood cells. Um, they primarily use glucose, um, your heart, which um, primarily uses fatty acids or if not glucose and ketones as well. Um, and for your brain, it's blood glucose or if not um, ketones. Um, so that's a really useful table. Um, if you understand that, if you keep that in mind, I'm sure you'll, you'll get 80% or, or even 90% of all metabolism sort of questions, right? Um, the big thing to note is um, that, like I said at the start, um, you've been learning for the past couple of weeks metabolism in isolation. So you've been learning about like certain molecules. So like lipids and then your carbohydrates um, and things like that. Um, the exam normally doesn't like to focus on, on those like sort of specific molecules as much. More so they'll ask about what is actually happening in the body's tissues. Um, so I'd say what I've kind of gone through is, is really your high yield stuff that you should keep in mind um, with metabolism. Um, because yeah, that'll, that is what is assessed at the end of the day. Um, and most likely assessed. Um, so on that note, um, thanks heaps everyone for coming down. Um, the main thing is we hope you learned something um, if you're here live or alternatively, if you are watching the recording, um, again, we hope you learned something. Uh, we hope you, yeah, thanks Chen. No, genuinely, you're a real one, Chen, um, a real OG. Uh, we appreciate it heaps. So um, thanks so much. And yeah, keep an eye on the Facebook page. Just gonna let you know there might be a few changes possibly occurring so please keep an eye on that um and yeah we hope you enjoy the changes if they do happen um and yeah we'll keep seeing you hopefully thanks everyone all right thanks everyone see ya